All right. I'm going to give you all a brief look into my past. Um, here's a brief look in my past. When I was four years old, my family moved out to a farm. Now, this may seem inconsequential. However, where a person lives often influences how a person chooses to spend their time. At the farm, I was always outside. I had a reputation for always being the dirtiest child around. I could be found in a tree on the roof, cutting down a tree to make a staff, as I used to call it. This love for the outdoors suddenly flowered into a passion for making things with my hands. Wooden boxes, boats, little houses, you name it. When I was five years old, my mom asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I responded with a guitar playing, soccer playing carpenter. <laughs> I guess my five-year-old self was pretty smart. When I was eight, we moved back into town. And for the first few years of living there, I continued to pursue my love for woodworking. I made rabbit hutches, bird houses, and other more slightly more complex projects. Then around the age of 12, I hit what I like to call the creative doldrums in my life. Suddenly I cared more about video games, sports, my appearance, my social status. Now I suppose these are extremely normal developmental things for a child to go through, but it does make me sad thinking about all of the hours that I poured into a screen. Hours that have now become agonizing for me to think about. In fact, I don't really even remember what I was doing during all of that time. The only thing those hundreds of hours playing video games has taught me is that I shouldn't have spent my time that way. When high school came upon me, things shifted. Now, instead of playing video games, I was at a friend's house. I became an entirely social human being. My sophomore year, I was barely at home. Friends first, everything else second. My sophomore year was certainly my worst academic year at Youth Initiative. Then came my junior year. Suddenly academics came before everything else. I was obsessed with achieving complete academic excellence to the detriment of most other facets of my life. Then suddenly one Friday noon, Friday afternoon, shortly after my birthday, we were all called to the lounge for an all school meeting. At this point, the coronavirus was just a meme that had been circulating our Instagram pages. <laughs> a distant reality that would most likely never really affect our lives. <laughs> It was announced that school would cease for the next month. <laughs> Tears were shed. Most of us walked away with puffy red eyes. Not I. My emotions tend to set in well past the event that causes them. At the time, I could not quite understand why everyone was crying, but I did my best to support those who were. It wasn't until the nights that I would cry, heart-wrenching tears that not even I could understand. Online school in the spring was miserable. Suddenly, all of my school-related commitments were virtual. The invitation committee was especially tough. We were having multiple meetings a day, which alone worked out to be three of the total seven hours I was spending a day on a screen. It was a dark time in most of our lives. Soon I realized that school wasn't gonna be enough for me. I was lacking happiness and creativity. I needed an outlet, something to distract me from the state of the world and the reality that I was living in. Fortunately, at that time in early May, my family's family was getting ready to move out to our beloved farm. Previously, I had presented my family's plans to move back there. I thought it would be impossible for me to see my friends. How would I have gone to the Grenier's every day sophomore year if we had lived there? How would I have made any friends? Fortunately, my values had shifted. I was ready for the creative abundance that living on a farm can bring. However, our house was too small for me to live comfortably and with my family. So they bought me a shed. Yes, it was insulated, but it was extremely rough. I took it upon myself to completely renovate this shed into a comfy little cabin. I had a blast, I was in a creative tunnel. The only things I could think about were what I was gonna work on next. I finished the cabin just in time for the move. I was nauseatingly excited. I was moving into a space that I, space that I had completely built for myself, except for the framing structure. Everything that surrounded me in that little house, I had created with my own hands. It was one of the best feelings I'd ever experienced. I fell in love with that feeling and haven't let go since. Now, how is that cabin holding up, you may ask? Well, <laughs> there are several aspects that are falling apart, <laughs> such as these and these. In fact, almost everything I did was very <laughs> sloppy work. If I'm being completely honest, I've thought many times about tearing everything down and doing complete remodel. Yet this cabin, although it is full of gaps and crooked boards, holds a very special place in my heart. 
It was the birth of an entire shift in my life's direction. Before I did the cabin job, I wanted to be a full bred intellectual. <laughs> I was reading huge books, not that I still don't do that. I wanted to get an eight year degree of some sort and do very worldly things, even though I didn't really know what that looked like in any capacity. When I finished the cabin, I went on to build an outhouse with my good friend, Amory Lenars. That was fun and helped prepare me for the big leagues. Our family was moving back to the farm because we were building a house. I had been offered a position on the crew, but hadn't really given it much thought until the cabin project. I thought I was in ship shape for working on the crew. Turns out I greatly overestimated my skill level. <laughs> the house. Working on the house crew was one of the best experiences of my life. The crew consisted of five wonderful guys. Adrian Hugo, my mentor, Frank Taylor, my grandpa Mike Knapp, Dave Puig, and Orion Lewicki. During the first month, I was subjected to one of the steepest learning curves I've ever had to go through. I was amazed by the perfection that needed to be achieved in any given area to move on. Every cut needed to be accurate to the 16th inch. Every wall needed to be perfectly level. Every room needed to be squared down to the eighth inch. And this was rough framing. I couldn't believe it. I had built many boxes that were more than an eighth inch out of square. <laughs> and those were tiny. I worked 40 hour weeks all summer long on the crew. And to this day, I can't think of a different way I would rather have spent my time. There were tough days where it was hot or rainy. There were scary days where I would spend the whole day on the roof or 50 feet in the air in a bucket. <laughs> Yet those days are why I love carpentry so much. Many, not, many jobs nowadays are full to the brim with monotony. You wake up, drive to work, exchange pleasantries with your coworkers, sit down and do completely algorithmically predictable things on the computer. Now, I'm sure jobs like this are the right thing for many people, but I thrive off of unpredictability and excitement. I would wake up each and every morning and usually have no idea what I was going to work on that day or what would happen when I did it. Soon I got so excited that I decided that this was what I was gonna do with my life, at least for the foreseeable future. So I started to buy tools. Since then, I've invested around most of my earnings, around $14,000 into my workshop. With these tools, I started to build furniture and loving it, I decided to make it into my senior project. Wood. Wood, in my opinion, is one of nature's most lovely facets. There's an incredible number of species and within every species, there's remarkable diversity. Every tree comes with its own unique story, a story that has unfolded over hundreds of years. We recently cut down an ash tree only because it was infected by the emerald ash borer and soon to die. I counted the growth, ring, growth rings and estimated that it was born, so to speak, in 1900. Imagine what was going on here in 1900. Trees, if allowed to grow and flourish, will live for hundreds of years, calmly swaying in the wind as humans blunder about worrying about trivial matters that from a tree's perspective are quite absurd. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout my short time making furniture, I've come to love working with the trees. In my opinion, you must work with the wood, not work on the wood. Highlight the magical imperfections, the knots and the crotches. Unfortunately, modern aesthetic furniture or design pop culture, so to speak, treats wood like a boring inanimate object. Maple, for example, a lovely wood that showcases a tremendous amount of variability is only really sought after if it is white maple. White maple mostly all looks the same. Or black walnut, America's most expensive hardwood is steamed to eliminate the sapwood to create a completely color constant result. Joinery, fine furniture, if it is truly fine, generally has a minimal number of screws. Instead, pieces are held together using joinery. Joinery in a nutshell can be described as wood fitting into another piece of wood. It has tremendous practicality. If a joint is cut well, it will last many decades. This is the reason why we still have authentic Victorian furniture. Craftsmen back then were incredibly skilled. Joinery is also an art form that can be used to showcase a woodworker's skill. Oftentimes on an expensive handmade piece of furniture, you usually see exposed joints. These are done to create aesthetics as well as being strong and to show everyone who looks at it the time and effort that was put into it and the skill of the person who made it. There are many forms of joinery, all of which are useful for different applications. One of the most common is the mortise and tenon joint seen in figure one to your left. You will see this in most pieces of furniture. It consists of a tenon, which can be cut in several different ways, generally either by hand or with a table saw, and a mortise, the hole that the tenon slides into. 
This can also be cut in several ways, generally by hand or with a router. Think of it like a key in a keyhole. Another common joint is the dovetail. You'll often see these on the inside of drawers and sometimes as an exposed joint because they're gorgeous and difficult to make look good. I did a wide variety of joint cutting in my furniture pieces. At first, I did mostly everything with a crosscut sled on a table saw. This is a quick and effective way to cut joints that requires relatively little skill, hence my method of choice when first starting out. However, soon I became discontented with the results I was getting on the table saw. So I started to cut joints by hand. I got really into it and it resulted in me do, doing two pieces completely by hand. All of the joints in these ash stools are cut with a chisel, a hand saw, and a hand plane. It took a long time, but the results were good. I also took up dovetailing by hand. Dovetailing is arguably one of the most difficult joints to cut by hand. You have to be unbelievably precise. If you're even a 32nd of an inch off, it shows. I'm not going to go into the detail of process of cutting dovetails because I don't want a sleeping audience. However, <laughs> I'll give you a brief crash course. First, you cut your tails. These are the part that looks somewhat like a bird's tail, hence the name. Generally, if you're making a box, you want your tails to be the same length as the thickness of the board you're joining to. Pins, the pins fit into the tails. These examples are called half blind dovetails. The tails are cut shorter than the other board so they don't come all the way through. When cutting pins, you'll lay the boards together in the orientation in which they're going to fit. Secure them so they don't move and then use a marking knife to trace around the tails so that you know where to chisel to. Then in the case of half blind dovetails, use the tool of your choice to clear out the waste. Once you're close to your marking lines, you take a chisel and slowly chip away until you reach your line. When chiseling, it's important to take a very small amount of wood off at once. If you try and chisel, say, a quarter inch of waste in one stroke, it will push back past your marking line and give you a garbage result. I like to get it to about a sixteenth of an inch or less before I make the final cut. If you take your final chop too soon, you get something like this. Garbage. <laughs> um, my design and building process. So first, I generally start formulating or working with someone to create a design over the course of about two weeks. Then I make a scaled drawing on graph paper with all of the correct dimensions and angles. Next, I plane and flatten all of my material. This is done with a planer and a joiner. What is planed to eliminate any saw marks and flatten and reduce them to the correct dimensions. Next, I cut everything with the correct lengths. This is where I have to start being really precise. And then finally, I cut all of my joints and fit the piece together. This process certainly is the most complex and time consuming of all the steps. Once everything fits together nicely, I sand each exposed piece progressively with 80 to 120 to 220 and sometimes 320 grit sandpaper. The piece is now ready for glue up. Glue up is certainly my least favorite aspect of building furniture. It's incredibly stressful. And if you don't do a good job, it can ruin your whole piece. It's stressful because you're working against time. It's best to get your piece all glued up in about 20 minutes or else the glue will start hardening before everything is clamped, which is really not ideal. You also have to worry about if everything is square and either be cleaning up glue squeeze up during or shortly after glue up. It's really, cleanup is really important because if you don't get the glue off during or shortly after, you get weird white spots when you finish the piece. If you look closely at most of my pieces, you'll generally find a couple of these spots. I haven't even come close to mastering the process. <laughs> Once the piece is glued up and unclamped, I do some touch-up sanding and then the piece is ready for finish. Many woodworkers don't like the finishing process because it's toxic and stinky, but I love it. When, <laughs> when you put the first coat of finish on, you get to see the wood come to life. Finish darkens and highlights the wood grain, at least the ones I like to use. Usually you wanna put at least three coats on with the light sanding in between. So now I'm gonna give you a quick glossary of all the work I did on this project. This is a desk I built myself in the early summer. Um, it marked the technical beginning of my senior project. It was really fun, but it's pretty rough. I did almost no sanding. However, this piece holds a certain sentimental value that my other pieces don't, simply because it was my first. Here is a picture of the joinery. Um, it features a castle joint, and that was ended up being one of my favorites. It's in almost all of my pieces. Um, this piece is built from white pine cutoffs um, from the timber frame part of our house and um, maple, cherry, and walnut. Um, this is a sink base I built for my family. 
It was also really fun. I learned a lot building this piece. Like most of my early projects, I don't love the way it looks now, um, <laughs> but its utility is quite excellent. The piece features um, four castle joints, which are mostly what hold it together. There are several lap joints and some simple grooves for the shelf. It is made almost completely from aromatic cedar with a bit of cherry because I ran out in the shelves. This is a little nightstand I built for Erica Brozier as a present. Here's a look at how it fits together. It features two castle joints, and this is a breakdown of how that joint works, simply because it's in so many of my pieces. Um, yeah. Um, and then this is a countertop I did for the Belling Duns. Uh, this picture doesn't really do it justice, as it's quite large. I had a hard time with this one because it's imperative that a countertop this big be extremely flat. Um, so as you can imagine, the glue up was pretty technical. This is a bandsaw box I built for my good friend Gia. Um, it's, it's made from one block of wood that's all glued up and then I cut it out pretty technically to make a box. And I encourage you to think about the process and try and figure out how I did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a live edge shelf I built for my lovely girlfriend Mahala. On the upper right, there's a picture of how it fits together and on the lower right is the underside of it. Um, it's made from maple and walnut. These are some fun little butcher block earrings I made. Um, these are 13 cutting boards I made as Christmas presents this year. <laughs> um, it turned out to be quite the commitment and the days before Christmas turned out rather intense. <laughs> um, it's a live edge shelf that I built for my stepmom Emma. It's jointed in the same way that Mahala's shelf was. This is a live edge end table that I built for the Belling Duns, piece number two. Thank you, Amy and Chris. <laughs> um, this is still one of my favorites to this day. Uh, there's a bunch of fun joinery. I love the design and the top is beautiful. This is a joinery breakdown. Um, designing and building a complex piece of furniture very much reminds me of designing and building a 3D puzzle out of wood. Um, yeah, and then this piece is also made from walnut and maple see a pattern is developing. Um, this is the cutting board I made for Taya Brozier. Funny story about this one. <laughs> I was very proud of it. Walked inside to have dinner, brought it in, showed it to my mentor, Adrian. He asked me how I joined it. I told him and he said, this will break. <laughs> Turns out it's plenty strong, but I forgot to account for wood expansion and contraction. Basically wood expands and contracts across the grain. So the pieces of wood in the cutting board will expand and contract in different directions. It's called a breadboard end. And then the way I did it basically is too tight. So it'll cause the glue seam to weaken over time and eventually split. He also said it might be totally fine and be an interesting experiment. Anyhow, as you can imagine, I was devastated. The last thing I want is for something I build to break. I put a four year warranty on it. If it breaks. <laughs> If it breaks within that time, I'm more than happy to build a new one. <laughs> Model 2.0, so to speak. Um, these were incredibly fun. I told you all about the stools already, but the table was really fun as well. The joinery on this project took an absurd amount of time. It took me around 50 hours just to do the joinery. But I think it turned out nicely and gave me a lot of practice. Um, here's the top of the table joinery and the stool top, which has an eighth inch hand cut butt imprint on it. My room. So it so happened that almost exactly one year apart, I got to build my room for a second time. This time I was ready. I went all out. Three weeks ago, I spent 55 hours in, on a week on it so I could get it done for this presentation. I really did everything this time. I helped build the walls almost a year ago. I built the bulkhead, the drywall, and all the finished work, including laying the floor and ceiling. I had just as much fun this time. Fortunately, it looks much better. It should hold up. Um, when I was working on my room, I had exactly the same feeling that I had a year ago. There's something about building a space that you're going to live in that feels amazing. It almost feels like you're triggering some ancient instinct from the time in which everyone had to build their own shelter to survive. Anyhow, who knows? But I hope that many of you get to experience building and working on a space that is yours. It's a really great feeling. This project has had its ups and downs. The downs mostly consisted of cut up hands and broken pieces of wood. <laughs> uh, 
Um, as you can see, I came rather close to cutting off my fingers several times. A rite of passage that most, most carpenters experience at some point. Hopefully I got that out of the way. Sometimes I would spend an hour cutting a joint and then break it because it was too tight. A very frustrating experience to say the least. However, during this project, I didn't lose motivation a single time. Every spare second I had, I would run into my workshop and disappear into its steps until my other commitments forced me to exit. My academics certainly suffered a bit. Overall on this project, I spent around 450 hours building furniture and around 1,200 hours building in general this year. Service component. I knew I wanted to build a piece of furniture and do something with it that benefited others. What that was, I wasn't sure for most of the year. Eventually I decided that I wanted the proceeds to go to Youth Initiative, a goodbye gift. I started talking to teachers and Sheila Sherwin, our development director. Eventually me and Sheila decided to have a raffle. However, there was a catch. The auction would be on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. I had to have it done by the 5th in order to have enough time to sell, pic uh, to sell tickets with pictures. It was already around February 23rd and my 18th birthday was on March 3rd. I wanted to have it done before my birthday so I could relax on that day. I set out to build the piece in a week. I did it, it took me around 35 hours in a school week. And then prior to the dinner, there was some legal confusion surrounding the raffle and we didn't get physical tickets until the weekend before the event. On Friday, Saturday and Sunday of that week, me and Lars sold 120 tickets. I sat at the co-op for five hours that Saturday it was pretty fun actually. And then the student body sold the remaining number of tickets. Anyhow, the raffle was a complete success. We ended up raising $1,285 and the winner was Lisa Ashley. I was overjoyed when I read her name on the ticket. I think nobody deserves it more than she does. In the beginning of 2020, I felt like I had been cursed, like a dark fog flowed around in my head. Then suddenly I felt like I'd been kissed by creativity and passion. This passion turned a potentially dismal year into one of the most, best years of my life. There's an inexplainable joy that working with wood gives me, a joy that I've never felt the likes of before. I hope to spend the rest of my life in an effervescent pursuit of growing my skills in woodworking. Artistic creation, no matter what the medium, is one of humankind's greatest blessings. Art leads revelationary movements changes our mood, and lets us express ourselves in incredibly nuanced ways. I believe humanity needs art to thrive and grow in our modern, and in our modern world, the artist is often looked down upon and undervalued. I hope that societal value shift and beauty and quality prevail once again. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, mom and Lars. Mom, thank you for taking care of me. I'm always throwing myself into things head first and I often forget to take care of myself and my responsibilities at home. I would be a mess without you. Lars, you've been a huge help this year. As I begin to explore the realms of self-employment, finances and overall just adult life, I've come to rely on your expansive wisdom and knowledge of how the world works. You both have guided me through life wonderfully thus far. Adrian, you go. Adrian, thank you for taking the chance of inviting a young and experienced teenager onto your crew. <laughs> a gamble to be sure. Thank you for teaching me more about one thing in a year than anyone ever has before. Working with you has been an honor and I hope to do so again in the future. Mahala, uh, you have been a constant support this year. Whenever I feel sad, stressed, or angry, you're always there to try and cheer me up, which is not an easy task. And thank you for pretending to care about every little word, woodworking thing that I'm excited about. <laughs> it's also not an easy task. Um, and the crew, thank you all for your constant patience, exp explanations, and teachings. I couldn't imagine a different group of people I would rather have worked with this year. And finally, thank you to all the people who wanted my work in their homes. This project would not have been the same without your support, particularly my dad. That was a huge project that now sits in the center of his kitchen, a very important area. Um, yeah, any questions?
Yes, beauty matters. Nice work. Uh, well done. Woohoo! Inspirational. Wow, it's so amazing. What an incredible body of work you created. I love that you gifted so many pieces. Thanks for all you've done. You've grown up so much. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Uh, questions. Um, Adrian, Adrian wants you to come build our kitchen. Ooh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Ouch, buddy. <laughs> Man, Paul's like staying. <laughs> or our bathroom. Wow. Even worse. Okay. Um, how about some questions from the from the room here? Yeah, go for it. Just be loud. What is your favorite wood? Whoa. It's getting personal. That's that is personal. Um gosh. I really love walnut. Um, it's one of the few woods that is dark. Um, and it's kind of it's also, I mean, it's very sought after in America, which is slightly frustrating. Um, but just the walnut and maple, actually, I really like maple too, just because you can almost get like every sort of wood in maple, mm -hmm. um, which is very unique. And I like a lot, of, I like all the woods. I mean, <laughs> they all have their use and they're all beautiful. You don't want to offend any woods. I don't want to. <laughs> um, do, you, do you have a woodworking style that you are drawn to or a specific artist? Ooh, Nekashima. He's a Japanese woodworker um, who sort of pioneered live edge woodworking in the 20th century. I can tell you much more than that because, you know. Cool. Uh, you should look him up. Cool. George Pretty Nekashima. George Nekashima. Pretty amazing journey from five till now. Um, any, it's five years old. Yeah. I know. Um, any, any, other, any other questions from the, from the room here? Um, oh, uh, are you thinking of exploring different kinds of joining in the future? Yes, Joinery. absolutely. I kind of got really stuck on the cast joint um, <laughs> just because I knew how to do it and it was strong and not super hard. Um, but there's, I mean, it's infinite. You can, you can, there's all sorts of joints. You can design your own joints. You can see what works. And so, yes, I do look forward to exploring that realm in the future. Okay, that's enough questions. I'm not gonna, there's no more questions from Julia. She has too many questions. Um, she, she wants to know if you're gonna find a new mentor. Um, what's, <laughs> what's next? Going to continue to seek out new mentorship? <laughs> do you wanna answer that? You don't have to. Okay, let's do this pause.